Hey Audiophiles, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. If you're a fan of the channel, you'll know that most of the videos we do here in Glen Rock, New Jersey are focused around vintage equipment. Um, anything from Macintosh, Mark Levinson, uh, Tannoy, and all these great brands. Um, once in a while, something modern comes through that sort of catches my attention. And that's what I have here today. I have a stack from Sim Audio. Uh, in the Moon series, and um, it caught my attention for its design, build quality, uh, simplicity of use, and all the great features that I look for in a modern brand. Now, I enjoy collecting vintage equipment, uh, but sometimes you get to a point where you want uh, a true representation of the recording. Not for all recordings, not for all days, but I like to kind of mix it up and have a bit of both. Uh, I like to have a, a vintage system somewhere in my life and also a modern system. And I use them very differently. Um, so Sim Audio is a brand that's always been on my radar. Uh, I've always admired their, their design and build quality. And um, as this came through this week, I thought I'd do a quick video and share this with you. So there are a lot of boxes here in front of you, but there's really only three components. Um, and uh, I'm going to go through uh, the models, the features, and, and why I like these particular pieces. Um, and then I'm going to play a little bit of music. Um, now, this system came from a local audiophile. We bought a complete system, and it was exactly this. It was um, a Sim Audio three pieces, a Focal pair of uh, floor standing speakers, and a turntable tuner, and a few other bits. But um, he took great care over many, many years. Um, to assemble the system. And I know that because oftentimes when we pick up a system, we're privy to the documentation that's left behind. And we can almost follow from beginning to end a lot of audiophiles journey uh, through the audio world. You know, what their earlier pieces were, what they transitioned to, and where they ended up. We often buy systems from elderly people that are downsizing or moving or deceased. So as we kind of rummage through their collection were often able to piece things together, which I find interesting. So this was this man's uh, <laughs> last hurrah. This was where he landed, and uh, he surely did a good job putting it together. Um, this is a great time that if you enjoy the videos, we'd love it if you could uh, subscribe and like the video to help keep us motivated. Um, so let me, let me jump right in. So three components here. We've got on the top and don't pay attention to the cabinets kind of uh, blending together, but there are in fact three distinct units. There's a CD player here, which is the player itself with a power supply, which is just below it. Uh, it's called the Andromeda. Below it is their P8 preamp, which is a wonderful analog, analog uh, preamp, with no phono section in it. It's a line stage, as we call it. But again, the controller and the power supply just below it. And below that is the W8 power amplifier, which is a substantial uh, class AB amplifier as well. Now, in the hi-fi world, as you go up the food chain of quality, price, and performance, things get separated into more boxes. So uh, CD player, you're probably not used to seeing it, but this is a two-piece CD player. This is the top of the top. Well, almost the top of the top. You could disintegrate or remove the DAC from the CD player and make it into a three or four piece system. But as far as comprehensive CD players, this is the Epicure CD drive power supply. And uh, that is Moon's philosophy or Simodius philosophy and has been for really for many, many generations is to really separate the power supply from the pieces as you go up the food chain. Um, some other pieces can be bought with an integrated power supply and then upgraded later to have a power supply. But this is the top of the top for them, at least back in the 2000s to 2012s or so. Same for the preamp. The preamp has a controller here and it's got the P8 uh, power supply section below it. Um, when I'll turn this around later so you can see the connections and how the power supply or is, is connected to the controller. And then a traditional one-piece power amplifier. Now, to go up in the level, you could do this as monoblocks, have two of these amplifiers bridged together or bi um, But again, this was the W8. This was the top of the line for them. Let me move the camera and give you a, a better view of what we're talking about. 
Now, the CD player is a top-loading CD player. Um, I like top loaders a lot. They're a little inconvenient depending on your rack configuration, but one of the things that we see over and over again are faulty drawers on CD players. So it's refreshing and kind of ensuring to, to have a, a CD player that has a top drawer on it. It means there's no moving parts, or at least very few moving parts. In this particular CD player, the only moving parts are going to be the laser sled and the uh, spindle for the CD. Now the spindles are really, really reliable. Rarely see one that fails. And so are the laser drives. They tend to fail not mechanically. They tend to fail electronically. So uh, this is a very reliable setup. As, as this is a good example of that, the CD player arrived here in working condition. So um, you drop the CD player in and then you put the magnetic puck in that kind of holds it in place, much like a turntable. So I'm a big fan of this setup, and it's a manual door as well. And as soon as you close it, the display goes into loading mode and feeds back the time. So it's read its uh, top of track. Now, aesthetically, the SIM audio line back in this era would have come in two options, this sort of black and white or silver and black uh, version, as well as an all silver version. I'm par sherry to this one. I love the two-tone configuration. The chassis are really top, top of the line in the industry. I can't think of a company other than maybe Burmeister or, or Cord that has this sort of level quality chassis. A huge chunks of extruded aluminum, uh, heat sinks throughout the entire sides of the cabinet. You know, great coupling feet to it. A thick, almost uh, 3 8 inch aluminum panel on it. Just throughout the box, you can just tell even the, even the top piece, where this normally would be a piece of sheet metal, this is actually some sort of cast aluminum. So absolutely highest quality casework we've seen. I also love their displays. Um, they're two to three times the average size. Now, that's good for aging audiophiles where your vision might be going. It's also good to be able to see it across a room. I often have the equipment set up pretty far from my sitting position. So I love a nice bright display, which is not customary. And of course you can dim it. So in a theater environment or if you like to listen to it in a low light environment, it's really nice to be able to dim the display. And that's available on both units. So other than the top loading uh, CD drawer, you've got some great top controls as well. So if this is low enough where you can see it, this is where your play, fast forward, and everything else sits. Of course this is all duplicated in the remote control as well. And there's a little indication here of the track that's playing, which is also cool. So top drawer or top loading CD players are not uncommon, but there are only a few I can think of that have controls at the top as well. All right, so the CD player technically, let me tell you about the technology in the CD player. So it's, um, it's a 16 times over sampling CD player, and it has a burr round filter, a DF1704, that feeds into uh, four 24-bit Burr Brown DDR converters, and that's a PCM1704. So, if you sort of look at the life cycle of the Redbook CD, and by Redbook I mean the original CD technology, not Super Audio or HD CD. We're talking the core, core original CD technology. This is the top. This was maxed out. You really couldn't go any further from this point. Yes, you can go into high-res audio but that you didn't come in a form of a CD. So this particular configuration using the 1704 Burr Brown data converters is about as good as it got. All right, now moving on to the, well, a few other things. Let me read from their actual manual of what they comment. So they're saying it's, um, you know, 16 times over sampling. It's got an RS-232 bi-directional port that we can control from an automation system. It uses the same audio SIM link that lets you have each of the components talk to each other so you can have a unified control system for them. The power regulation uses an independent inductive DC filtering, which seems to be their technology. Um, and it is in fact, uh, I believe I read somewhere that this is in fact a dual mono design, meaning there are two sets of transformers, power supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So, Moving on to the preamp. The preamp is a P8 controller. All right, so this preamp would have retailed somewhere around, 
uh, $11,000 back in 2006, I believe it was launched, and it kind of probably ended in uh, around 2012. So $11,000 for the PA controller, which is quite a bit of money. Um, the CD player, the Andromeda, which we've already featured, would have been even more at 13500 And then the amplifier uh, retailed at around 10200 So the P8, let's see, they call it a um, dual mono fully balanced differential unit. So using three custom proprietary tor toroidal transformers, two for the auto circuitry and one for the digital controller. And that's what's essentially in the secondary box is all the power supply, actually three of them in total. And it's nice when they separate the analog from the digital and the control circuitry. That's, that's a great design intent. All right, um, moving on to the amplifier. And that's this guy right below. The amplifier is a W8, so dual mono, fully balanced differential as well. That means essentially there are two amplifiers in a single case sharing a power cord. It's one of the few things they'll share in there. 240,000 microfarads of supply capacitance, which is fairly, fairly sizable filter stage for an amplifier running at 250 watts, um, and two 1.3 kV toroidal transformers. So we we're going to take a look inside, we'd see two massive uh, toroidal transformers. Weighing in at 95 pounds, it's no lightweight amplifier. You can see the heat sinks are built into the side of the case. Um, and it follows the exact same design cabinetry as the rest of them. Another thing that's neat is that they use a four-layer PC board. I guess it's not uncommon of this generation, but that's when they stack the, the PC boards and they, and they put layers in between them. And in this particular case, the engineers designed it so that a different kind of signal goes through each of the layers of the PC board. So they might carry signal on one layer and carry voltage on another and maybe digital information on another. So it kind of keeps the signals you know, physically isolated from each other on a single PC board. Now that makes it really difficult for us to service. Uh, Soldering components and removing components from multi-layered boards is, is pretty tricky, especially some of the larger capacitors and things. But from a design point of view, it's, it's pretty solid. Now, the spacing between the units is a little particular. Um, these come with a set of spikes, which we don't have on all the units. But they're a really neat coupling feet that you can buy, also not in place, that really would couple these two pieces together. And we have some on order for this system, because we don't have the correct spacing here. Um, so the way we're going to eventually sell this unit is with a coupling feet between the CD player and the power supply and a set of coupling feet between the preamp and the power supply for the preamp. All right, so let me uh, uh, put the camera down. I'm going to flip these units around and continue. Okay, now we're going to take a look at how this system gets connected. Um, recapping, this is the CD drive control at the top and the CD power supply just below it. And you can see we've got two sets of um, balance cables that are proprietary for this system. These are provided with it. Um, this one in particular has a, sort of a, an RJ45 style connector for DC power output number two and for DC power output number one it has a four pin kind of DIN or XLR connector. So I believe I read before that um, one of these, the DC output power one or two, I can't remember which one, is for the digital side of business and the other one is for analog. So uh, the circuitry inside of the CD player is divided into analog and digital and uh, each power supply does its respective duties. On the back of the CD player, we've got the right analog output here for both XLR and RCAs, and the left here. And as well as digital inputs, we've got a single um, SPDIF digital input and a set of outputs in case you want to use an external DAC, both AES, EBU, and SPDIF. So pretty capable. It's nice to have this digital input in case you want to feed a streamer through the CD player's DAC as well. Up top, we've got the SIM link. This is how this unit would talk to the preamp um, 
for control functions, for remote control functions. And the IR in lets you um, shoot infrared to the unit in case you have it enclosed in a cabinet. Pretty straightforward, power, uh, IC power cord at the bottom with a power button. Now the preamp's a little more complicated. Let's see if we can get a good angle on it. So from right to left, we've got the power cord. And then the power supply, which is the larger of the two boxes of the preamp, has three sets of umbilicals connecting it to the audio circuitry. The first one here on the left is a DC power supply for the right channel, then power, then communications between the two boxes, and then power output for the left channel. So in the preamp, they've separated into essentially a dual mono configuration for power supply for the left and a separate power supply for the right, which is a pretty cool way to do it. And then below are all the analog audio connections. There is no digital connections on this preamp. It's all full balanced analog in XLR and RCA using the highest quality RCA connectors that are available. So pretty straightforward there. So to recap, this unit, the larger, has the power supply and the digital controls and the display, and then where it matters, which is the audio circuitry, it's in its own box handling just the analog audio functions. Ideal design. I believe Macintosh does the same way on their C1100 preamp, which I'm a big fan of. And then but down below on the amplifier, real straightforward stuff. This is things you've seen before. Uh, we've got IC power cord, power button, fuse. The trigger, this is how you would turn it on from the other components. That way when you turn on the preamp, you get power on on the amp. And then XLR and single ended inputs, as well as dual parallel speaker outputs. So this would be great if you want to buy wire your speakers. Uh, you would run maybe one speaker output to the tweeters and mids and the second speaker output to the bass. So really nice flexible wiring configuration or you can just use a single set. So not much there. All right, the remote control is, is aluminum heavy affair. Um, all these manufacturers seem to keep upping how heavy the remotes are. This one's fairly substantial where if you were to throw someone, throw it to someone in anger, you could probably put them in the hospital. Um, fairly straightforward, nothing, nothing intricate about it, but as soon as you connect the uh, serial links or the SIM link between the controllers and the CD player, you can just narrow it down to a single remote, which is cool. All right, next I'm gonna flip it back around and see if it makes sound. Okay, we're back and connected back up. Now I'm gonna play just a, a minute or so of, of a track so you can get a sense for this. Now, I realize that playing a hi-fi system over YouTube over a simple microphone is not a very revealing uh, way of doing things and I am not a huge fan of it, but people always ask, well, what does it sound like? What does it sound like? You know, I live in all the way in Alaska. I don't get to hear systems like this. And so something is better than nothing. So I'm gonna play to that. And I'm also going to say goodbye just in case YouTube decides to uh, ban the video for copyright violations. So uh, before I hit play, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you all for watching this video and encourage you to visit us online at skyfiaudio.com where you can see hundreds and hundreds of, of items uh, for sale, both vintage and new, all curated and meticulously maintained for you. So thanks for watching and let me go ahead and uh, hit play now. This is Romeo Calling from a jackpot telephone Shame, shame But I love your name And the way you make the muffler This is goodbye. Oh, you packed up your heart and you left no souvenirs. But if you want me, you can call me in the night you.